If an aircraft cockpit was completely filled with black smoke, would it be possible for the pilots to open one of the windows in order to see a bit better? In this episode, I will answer three of your most commonly asked questions about the UPS Flight 6 episode I did on Mentor Pilot, and those are some great questions, so stay tuned. The episode that I did over on the Mental Pilot channel about UPS Flight 6 was one of the most harrowing episodes that I've ever done. The amount of fear, stress and just horrible circumstances that these poor pilots were subjected to during this episode just made the hair stand up on my arms. And that's both because I've been an airport firefighter and because I'm a commercial pilot. But it also meant that you guys had a lot of questions and I have looked through them now and there is a pattern to those questions. There are three of them that are the most common ones and those are the questions that I'm going to be answering in this episode. The first question, why didn't the air traffic control center in Dubai just change their own output frequency so that they could use Bahrain's frequency and talk directly to the aircraft? First of all, I just want to highlight how good of a question this is. Right? Those of you who asked this question, kudos to you. You really have your head screwed on correctly. Because this is a question that the investigators that came out with the final report also asked. Why isn't this possible? In the episode, UPS Flight 6, a Boeing 747 that was flown during the event, elected to turn back towards Dubai as they were heading towards Bahrain. But because they elected to turn back and they started descending, they very soon came out of radio coverage from Bahrain. But because the smoke inside of the cockpit was so bad, the first officer was unable to see his own radio tuning panel. So he could not change the frequency over to Dubai so he can speak directly to Dubai. And because of this, and because he was still on the Bahrain frequency, they started to do something called a relay procedure, which is where the pilot called his message, another aircraft that was closer to Bahrain and higher up heard the message, they then relayed it to Bahrain, Bahrain then called Dubai via landline, Dubai told them what the information they you know, needed was, and then it went back to Bahrain, up to the aircraft, and then back to the original aircraft. It was a total of six different movements needed in order for one message to go through. And of course, in a critical situation like this, when the aircraft is on fire and you are, you know, your cockpit is full of smoke, this is not what you want. You want quick access to information so that you can get radar vectors down onto the ground as quickly as possible. But when the investigators asked this question, they found out that the air traffic control units were physically unable to change their output frequency, right? They had their own frequency. The tower frequency in Dubai had their own frequency. The approach frequency had its own frequency. And they could not go in and manually change that so that they could use Bahrain's frequency. And in fact, this was one of the findings and one of the recommendations that came out of the final report that indeed, in an emergency situation, these different ATC control units should be able to change their output frequency so that they can speak to any aircraft in the emergency. The second most common question was, what would have happened if the crew elected to, instead of turning back to Dubai, which is about 180 miles, they would just continued towards Doha, which was the closest available airport? This scenario was also covered in the final report and the outcome of that was inconclusive. What we do know is that the fire would have continued to rage just as it did. This means that the problems that the captain had with his oxygen supply would have still happened even if they continued towards um, Doha. So the captain would have become incapacitated anyway the cockpit would have been as full of smoke and the first officer would have had as much problems to fly the aircraft as he had anyway. But there are two things that would have been different. First of all, they're moving in a westerly direction. So there would have been a little bit more daylight going in that direction. So it's possible that visibility inside of the cockpit might have been better. However, I highly doubt that and so did the investigators. The second thing, which is probably the most important thing, is that if they would have done that, they would have had continuous radio coverage the whole way down. So that means that the first officer wouldn't have had to go through this relay chain to get messages. He would have been able to speak directly to air traffic control on the frequency he was on. And that could have made the difference. That could have meant that air traffic control could have told him that he was coming in very hot and high, that he needed to descend, uh, that he needed to slow down, that he needed to arm the approach. And it could have also given them radio frequencies that needed for 
tuning for the ILS, for example, in order to do a landing. Now, whether or not that would have been successful if he would have been able to outland, because remember, he would have still had the problems with his manual control. So the only way he could have landed that aircraft effectively would have been through an outer land. If that would have been successful or not, it's impossible to say. And that's what the final report said as well. But with this question comes another question that I just wanted to expand a little bit on. So a lot of people in the comments also asked, why would the crew elect to return back to Dubai when it was almost twice as far away as Doha, which was straight ahead. I did talk a little bit about this in the video, but I wanted just to continue to explain that a little bit. Um, the, the, the way that we pilots and all human beings are built is that we tend to always seek the path of least resistance. So this means that if you've just departed from an airport, You've just taxied out, you've just talked to those air traffic controllers, you know the runway layout, you also know the uh, frequencies for the instrument landing system, for example. When you are faced with a direct emergency, the path of least resistance is going to feel like going back to what you know. Just to give you an example, imagine yourself driving through town, right? Your hometown. You're driving the same road as you always do. Now, as you get to the other side of town, you get a phone call who says that your child is sick, you need to return home immediately. If you had to choose, would you return the road that you knew that might be a couple of kilometers longer? Or would you risk it and take maybe a road through town that you know is shorter, but you're not sure it's going to be quicker and you're not really sure about the way? If you put yourself in that situation, it's going to be much easier for you to understand why a pilot would make that decision. Because in this case, the difference between 180 miles and 100 miles is not as big as it sounds. It goes quite quickly in an aircraft. So yeah, it is twice as far away, but it is likely that the pilot, you know, being in this situation, having a fire in the back and a fire warning in the back, at least that's what they had when they took the decision, is going to want to take the familiar road back. Now we will never know exactly how they thought. But I, as a pilot, do understand why they took the decision, even if it can turn out sometimes to not be the correct one. Now, the last and by far most asked question was, could the pilots have opened the window or even smashed the window in order to get rid of some of the smoke inside and maybe, you know, see better inside of the cockpit or being able to look out through that smashed window and maybe see better? Well, the answer to that question is no and no, you won't. Now, it is a really, really good question, though, because on the aircraft that I fly, the Boeing 737NG, we have the ability to open the side windows, even in flight. Obviously, the aircraft needs to be depressurized because the way that you open the window is that you pull the window in through a lever and then it goes backwards. If the aircraft is pressurized, there is no way you'll have the strength needed in order to move the window inwards. But if the aircraft is depressurized, like it was in the case of the, the UPS-6 flight, well then, if it would have been a 737, we would have been able to open the window. And fun fact about the Boeing 737 is that the nose is actually built so that it creates an aerodynamic bubble over the side window, so that if we do open the window in flight, it will be very, very noisy in the cockpit, but not even a whiff of wind will come in. Okay, and I know this because I've actually done it in real life. In the beginning of my career, I was in a situation where we needed to open the side window. And I can tell you right now, I've never been so strapped in in my entire life, but we opened it. The aircraft was at a speed of maybe 210 knots, so holding speed more or less. And when we opened it, like I said, it became really, really noisy outside, but there was no wind coming in. Absolutely fantastic design. But on the Boeing 737, we actually have a step in our smoke removal non-normal checklist that tells us that if the smoke has been confirmed to be coming from the flight deck and not from some other part of the aircraft, then as a final step, we can actually depressurize the aircraft, open the window, and that might help. So why is this not a possibility on the 747 then? Well, it's just because the window cannot be opened. Right? This Boeing 747 does not have a window that can be open as part of the cockpit. If the pilot need to have some kind of emergency egress after an emergency landing, they use a hatch in the top of the cockpit to get out instead. So there was no practical way for the first officer of UPS-6 to actually open the window. 
But then we come to the other part of the question, which is, well, could he not find something and smash the window and that would help? And the answer to that is no, okay? The cockpit windows of a airliner is built to be able to withstand a bird strike, and a pretty large bird strike at fairly high speeds, right? There's an enormous potential energy that's being transferred onto the windows then. And because of that, it is built up kind of like a sandwich. So you start up with a semi-tempered glass at the outermost pane. And inside of that, you have a heat film that keeps the whole window heated. And that's heated from, you know, from when we are about to start pushback until we shut down the aircraft. It's continuously heated. And that's not just to get rid of ice, it's also to keep the window flexible so that it can take an impact and not shatter easily. Inside of that heat film, you then have a layer of chemically strengthened glass, followed by a layer of PVB or vinyl, and then another layer of chemically strengthened glass. So you can see that with this layering, it would probably be easier to punch a hole next to the window rather than through the window. Trying to break the window from the inside will not work. Now, I love answering these questions for you guys. Every time that I put a video up on the Mental Pilot channel and I read through the comments, I see these lovely, thoughtful, intelligent questions. And that makes me want to create more content like this. So please, in the comment section here below, put in what you think about this channel and the format, if you have any questions about anything else, and let's just keep this discussion open. Also, I know that I promised you a live stream, and I have been fiddling around with the Mentor Now channel to be approved for live streaming. It is now approved, so you can expect the live stream to come up very, very soon, and I'm so looking forward to talk to all of you. Now, if you want to have a discussion directly with me face to face, I highly recommend you to become a part of my Patreon crew. I have weekly hangouts with my Patreons on Zoom where we talk about everything. Mostly aviation, of course, they get to ask their questions, but we also talk about what's going on in the world. And it's just like having a, you know, a cup of coffee or a cup of tea with a bunch of friends that have similar interests. It's really, really nice. And we normally sit for, you know, between an hour and two hours talking. So if that sounds interesting to you, well then go to patreon.com slash mentorpilot. I have a link here in the description as well and join up. Any support is hugely appreciated. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.